One of the most puzzling concepts you can try to wrap your mind around is the true nature of reality. I mean, when I look around with my meat eyeballs, I see trees and houses, rocks, and a camera. But I know that these things I see aren't actually what they really are. I mean, when we see colors, we're seeing photons of electromagnetic radiation emitted or reflected from the objects around me. The color green that I see, so much green, isn't green at all. It's just photons with a wavelength of 495 to 570 nanometers, jiggling photoreceptors in my eyeballs. I think that's the technical term for it. Which my brain uses to construct an idea of the world around me. Am I feeling the ground beneath my feet? No, again, my brain is interpreting signals from nerves that tell me that I'm standing. Since we can't even trust our own senses to know if we're actually in reality or living in a simulation, it's really, really tough to try and decipher the underlying nature of reality itself. But of course, the question, what is the nature of reality, is so fascinating that scientists can't help themselves to try to get to the bottom of it. One theory that I'm sure you've probably heard is the holographic principle, first proposed by Gerard de Hooft a few decades ago. And this theory claims, actually, you know what? This question is way beyond my pay grade. Once again, it's time to call in a bigger brain, Dr. Paul Matt Sutter. Dr. Sutter is an astrophysicist at Ohio State University and mainly studies the largest nothings in the universe, cosmic voids. He also hosts a fascinating podcast called Ask a Space Man. Hey, Paul. Hey. Welcome back to the Guide to Space. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, yeah, virtual Fraser. We got a tough one for you today. The holographic principle. Are you ready for a, a, a mental beating? <laughs> I, I, no, but I have, no. I, I'll, we'll do the best that we can to struggle through this. Uh, so before we get into the holographic principle, let's lay some grounder here and just understand what is a hologram? Mm, yeah, good question. So a hologram is very simply, it's a mathematical thing where you encode high dimensional information, like say three dimensional information on a lower dimensional structure. So that's most commonly used in the eponymous holograms where you're actually storing three-dimensional information about a structure's uh, extent and properties in a two-dimensional form. So you're pulling out all the information you need out of the three-dimensional image and you're storing it in two dimensions and then you can recreate it at will. Right, and I think the thing that's, that's important for this conversation is this idea that you are encoding a higher dimension of information in a lower dimension and can kind of access it. So, so how does this lead to the holographic theory of the universe? Yeah, so it actually starts not with the universe itself, but with black holes. Uh, it was found uh, about a couple decades ago that if you were to add one bit of information to a black hole, the black hole would grow because that bit represents uh, energy. And so as black holes consume things, they grow. But if you add exactly one bit, the surface of the black hole grows by a very specific amount. It actually grows by one square Planck unit. So a little square with a, a Planck unit on one side and a Planck unit on the other. So interesting when it comes to black holes, the information content of a black hole is proportional not to its volume, but to its surface area. And so there's this kind of intuition that the quote unquote information that uh, fell into a black hole, the record of everything that fell into a black hole may not actually be inside of it, but may be kind of pasted on its surface on the event horizon. And that event horizon, that surface is two dimensions. So you're encoding three dimensional information about the universe of everything that fell in onto two dimensions. Now, going from black holes to the universe isn't quite as challenging as it may seem. There's, again, this intuition or this possible interesting thought. I want to caution that these are uh, very speculative uh, theoretical physics things happening here. Right. Possibly untestable. A possibly completely untestable, uh, you know, even in principle, but we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, 
that it could be that all the three-dimensional information of our universe, or four-dimensional if you include time, if you were to uh, splat it out onto our cosmological horizon, which is the limit of what we can see, that two-dimensional surface would contain uh, an accurate record of everything that's in the universe, and you could reconstruct everything in the universe if you so wanted to. But the way that makes it sound, and I think the way it's often described in, in magazines and online newspapers and crank theories, is that we're living in a hologram? Is that, is that how this, that's what it sounds like? Yeah, and you know what? You actually can't blame the crank theories for once, because if you go read uh, Gerard Duff's, uh original papers on this subject, like the title, I forget the title, but it's something like, you know, life in a hologram, or, or <laughs> you know, the theoretical physicists themselves are kind of using this kind of flowery language to explore this metaphor. But really what it is, it's a convenient mathematical tool because some questions in physics are super hard. Questions like about gravity. And solving it in our full three dimensions is really, really hard, but it might be, and again, might be, easier to solve these problems on the two-dimensional surface rather than the three-dimensional volume. And so it's not really that the universe is two-dimensional and we're living in a three-dimensional production of it. It's just that there's some convenient mathematical translations that we can take advantage of to make our mathematical lives easier so that we can make predictions about how the universe works. Okay, so then why does a theory like this exist? I mean, at the heart of it, what are physicists trying to explain with the holographic principle. Right, the name of the game here is gravity. We do not understand quantum gravity. We have no quantum theory of gravity. And solving that appears super hard in our three dimensions. We just, we just have no theories. All of our theories break down. All the mathematics leads to infinity. Right, that's what I understand. Like, if you try to take your, your equations for quantum mechanics and try to plug in gravity, everything goes to infinity, nothing makes any sense. It's two things that just do not go together. Yep, and so it just goes nuts. But it was found, it was found that if you make this mapping, if you make this holographic mapping from our three-dimensional universe to the two-dimensional surface, when you perform that operation of making the mathematical translation, gravity disappears. It just goes away. Well, that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. That's super great because then you, can, then you don't have to worry about it. So uh, our three-dimensional universe with gravity might be equivalent to a two-dimensional universe with no gravity. And so the hope, and again, this is this is bleeding edge theoretical physics. There's this I'm talking about it in super sketchy terms because you know that, that we just have the barest sketch of an idea here that instead of trying to directly track tackle quantum gravity, instead you make this transition to the two-dimensional surface of the universe, do some calculations there that are normalizable or renormalizable that don't lead to infinities and then make the translation back and you can make predictions of how our universe works. Uh, okay, so that's starting to make a little bit of sense to me. It reminds me of times when in math, in high school and even in university, where you would take some equations that you're working on, you'd move them to a place to look at them in a way where a lot of the, the complexities were not there solve it in a certain way and then bring it back and reinterpret it to give you a bigger picture. And so it's like if the physicists can really wrap their heads around it in this two-dimensional way, then it gives us some inkling, a better understanding of what the nature of gravity really is and how we can mesh them back together in terms of quantum mechanics. Exactly, exactly. But again, the big caveat here is that this mapping between the three-dimensional universe and the two-dimensional service uh, may not apply in our actual universe. It may just be a mathematical fiction. Right. And on that two-dimensional service, uh, you know, we don't exactly have robust 
uh, mathematical models or descriptions of what's going on, and then going from there back to predictions of the real universe or our three-dimensional universe, uh, those connections are super tough and super fuzzy. So there's like three potential ways that all of this could break down. All right, well, in a second, we're going to bring it around and explain why the holographic principle was in the news all over again. But first, I'd like to thank Steve Wolfhope, Matt Douglas, Tom Van Scotter, Jeff Borst, Viva Tomlin, and the rest of our 698 patrons for their generous support. If you love what we're doing and you want to help out, head over to patreon.com slash universe today. So, as I mentioned, you know, in the news recently was a new announcement that the holographic principle has more evidence? What, what was going on here? Yeah, so uh, like I said, these connections where you map from the three-dimensional universe to the two-dimensional uh, surface, you do some math with no gravity, and then you turn it back around to make predictions of how the universe works. That's all super sketchy, but you know theorists are starting to make some inroads, and they're starting to make some predictions of how the early universe ought to behave. And we can't directly probe like the first second of the universe in the Big Bang, but we can study the afterglow light pattern, that cosmic microwave background which was released just 300,000 years into the Big Bang. So we can make predictions of the very early universe, and we can see how that might play out 300,000 years later when the cosmic microwave background was released. And so already there are some, again, very sketchy, vague theories, but some of them have already been ruled out by observations. And there's a few intriguing paths that... I don't want to say confirmed by observations, but they're allowed by the current levels of uncertainty in the observation. And they don't necessarily do any better or worse than any other existing model that doesn't include all these uh, projections and deep projections into different dimensions. Okay, so so it's kind of like, like I know when you're doing science, when you're sciencing, you are trying to essentially invalidate your own theories. You're looking for reasons why your theory isn't going to work. And, and if I understand, then, then new discoveries, new models for the universe don't invalidate this holographic principle. So it's, so it's not dead yet. Yeah, and, and that's because the holographic principle is really just that. It's like a statement uh, it's a very broad and general statement. What really matters is the mathematical guts. And we haven't fully fleshed out those guts yet, but there are some intriguing sketches that uh, some of those sketches have been ruled out by the data and some haven't. All right. Well, that's it. Thanks a lot, Paul. Hey, no problem. So if we've done our job, you have a better sense of the holographic principle and what it means to help us understand the universe around us. Thanks again to Dr. Paul Matt Sutter for helping me, even if I'm already confused again. This topic was requested many times. See, you listen. What other baffling concepts in space and astronomy would you like to learn about? Let me know your ideas in the comments. And make sure you go to Dr. Paul Matt Sutter's YouTube channel, Ask a Spaceman. We'll link it up right here. All the large planets in the solar system have rings, but Earth doesn't have rings. What's that about? Why doesn't Earth have rings? What would it look like if it did have rings? Is there any situation that could give us rings? That's coming up in our next episode. One related concept of the holographic principle is the black hole information paradox. If you want to understand this bizarre concept, which actually Paul helped to understand even a little better today, here's a video that'll help you out. Give me a headache making it, so I hope you enjoy it.